Yeah, it's uh, kind of funny. Um, a couple of years ago, um, I, I actually uh, invited Professor Dasher to give a talk for the APEC summit that we hosted in the Philippines. And he was um, extremely generous to actually spend uh, 12 hours on the plane and give the keynote for the APEC Innovation uh, Summit that we hosted in Manila. Uh, and actually, because of that, Professor Dasher, uh, we then created a National Innovation Center because we proved to actually wow. to the government that the industry was real. It wasn't a kind of a cottage industry, but actually an industry that the government should support. So, well, I remember that uh, Slingshot MNL was yes, the name of this conference, yeah, so, and I remember 115 or 120 startups that had demonstrations there, so including we, some really interesting little companies. We were pretty lucky um, uh, at that point in time. So I think my talk will, 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 will discuss really the evolution of our ecosystem, what types of startups actually have come out of our ecosystem, and maybe how different it is compared to even my time here in Silicon Valley of what type of startups have emerged in this type of emerging market, right? Um, so um, that's kind of what it is. So what is the story of the Philippine start ecosystem, which I think the angle that I want to tell you today is how do we focus it on emerging market needs because that is the context and that it also is the, um, the driver or the pain points that people have. So uh, Professor Dash already kind of gave some color on, on my own experience, but just to add a little bit more. So I actually uh, was born in LA, but I grew up in Manila um, my entire childhood. And then I went to the US for college, uh, grad school, um, business school here. I was an aerospace engineer, uh, kind of funny. I was in Raytheon I didn't know uh, for that. a bit. And then I went to Cisco. And after a, a couple of years, actually I was here for about 12 years, and I was really thinking of, you know, what's happening back in, in the Philippines. Um, you know, I've been here for a while and I said, you know, how can I actually think about it and, and give back what a knowledge I've had and literally spur up the startup ecosystem, right? And at the time, actually this is like the current stats, but at the time it was kind of have some similar statistic where I reflected as like an investor, why would I bet some portion of my life and maybe coming back to a place like the Philippines. So first of all, I thought like culturally, it's kind of cool. So we're the only uh, kind of Spanish colony in the entire Asian kind of continent. So I said like we party like the Latins. So if you guys been to Latin America, it's kind of a cool culture. Um, but then we were also like a, an American colony for a while. So we actually do business like other Americans. Um, some, some random fast fa facts is that actually our national pastime is basketball because of the huge American influence uh, in the country, right? But uh, some other th things that I think objectively why a place like the Philippines would be somewhat uh, of a good investment for your career or in a sense kind of my career at the time and broader Southeast Asia because of some of these facts, right? So number one, at least just from the Philippine context, it's already 102 million people. And just to give perspective, America is about 300 million people. So you have like one third population of like an America in one country, right? So like the Philippines, most of them speak English, if not all. Um, and then for the past five years, actually, we've been at least 6% growth GDP year on year. So that's kind of in the hyper growth. In fact, the last time I spoke here um, in Stanford, in, in Professor Dasher's class, we were I think the second fastest growing economy in the world, but at seven plus percent after China. But what actually catches a lot of attention of the investors from a, from a macro perspective actually is this, the median age of the country, which is about 24 years old. So what does that mean? There's just a huge amount of runway, both perhaps at the positive side, right? Growing middle class, consuming of the internet, et cetera. But then it could also go the other way, which is can we actually provide jobs and opportunities for this, I think, millennial first country, right? Um, our GDP per capita, the most recent one, is still kind of still relatively low. It's about $3,000 kind of per capita. And just, I just like to put there how many islands there is because you know, I think that that puts out the kind of a perspective of how also difficult it is to actually create a unified startup ecosystem for the entire country because they're not just one big landmass, right? Um, 
But I think this type of statistics is something to appreciate the entire Southeast Asia, where in fact investments has been going from all over the world, from Europe, from Japan, uh, from China, and from the US to actually help the entire block of Southeast Asia. It was about 600 million people with also a kind of a median age of about the mid 20s to make it like economic kind of powerhouse over the next couple of years. So, um, so that's another thing to kind of think about is when we, I talk about the Philippines and the opportunity in the country, also think about what is the opportunity in the broader region of ASEAN, right? So, um, and I've been a kind of a witness of both the Philippines and the ASEAN perspective over the past five years. Um, so um, 500 startups has like a kind of a semi-annual kind of investor geek kind of, um, kind of gathering where they bring in like 40 to 50 investors to certain regions and different parts of the world. So I was like the Manila host and I was also part of Geeks in a Plane Southeast Asia for with 500 and Dave, kind of McClure and Kylie. Um, I also started this kind of conference called Geeks in a Beach, kind of a fun conference. Uh, most of it are probably international investors and we just said like, why would someone come to the Philippines and learn more about our culture and our startup ecosystem? And uh, by the time we had the number one beach in the world called Baraka, until now it's actually number one from Condé Nast. And uh, I said, why don't we create like a cool um, kind of conference called Geeks in the Beach. Um, I'm also an advisor uh, to uh, the Philippines through Stack Science and Technology Advisory Council. Um, I started Idea Space, which is still the largest uh, startup incubator and accelerator in the country. Now we've got 50 plus startups. I think we're gonna invest or support again another 10 over the next couple of months. And then I'm also part of the WEF uh, YGL, which literally thinks about how do we use innovation to impact billions of people, right? So improve the state of the world. Right, so some personal story too. So I'll, I'll talk about many different stories, both from my story and also an entrepreneur story of, of why we created something like Idea Space. Right, so when I was about 17 or 18, I went for my, my first two years of college in the largest state college in the Philippines called the University of the Philippines. Um, so in order to get to the engineering program, so 70,000 take the test and you have to be in the top 2% of the entire test in order to qualify for the engineering program, right? Uh, so that's kind of what it is. So I grew up in relatively kind of, you know, elite bubble in the country. Um, so where I grew up, like that's where like you know, presidents lived and you know, people like in our version of Hollywood lived and all these things, right? But then when I went to the state college, I then realized like, wow, you know what, like how, how different it is, the reality of the situation in an emerging market versus a place like Silicon Valley or New York, right? Where there is in a sense a lot of aspiration, but in a sense very limited opportunity. Right, so my, literally, you know, my classmates, who again were the top 2% of 70,000, uh, were sons of farmers, taxi drivers, they were smart, I, you know, they got 90 in the test, I got 65, right? Um, and literally, they said that we're betting, our family, literally generations of their family are betting their life on me, right? That I actually graduate from engineering, get a job, maybe go abroad and then feed literally like tens, if not 15 people, right? So that's the type of thing at age 18 or even 16, that's the pressure that they have, right? So um, when I decided to leave, uh, the dean uh, of the college, which ironically now is the undersecretary of the Department of Science, um, basically scolded me for, a, for, for an entire hour, if not hour, of two hours, and said, I took someone's spot because I should have, you know, I could have gone to a different school where literally in this, but I vowed to return, basically, right? Like uh, what uh, I think Douglas MacArthur said about the Philippines, right? So I said, I'm gonna come back someday, and they're like, to see is to believe, right? Um, so I always had that in my mind. So that's basically the context, right? I said, at some point, how do we actually give more opportunities to, to people like my classmates? right, who were way smarter than me, but then not necessarily had the same opportunities that I had growing up, and even financial opportunities to just say like, you know what, I'm gonna, I got a scholarship to go abroad, and I'm gonna go and literally like, uh, go undergrad somewhere else. So when I was about 
27, 28, um, I got to meet. So actually, uh, Manny Panglin, MVP, g gave us a speech here in Stanford that Professor Dasher kind of hosted. And he asked me kind of one question while I was there on vacation. He said, what's your goal in life, Earl? And I said, you know, maybe when I'm 50 or 60, I want to become the minister of science of the country. And he said, like, you know, people in government, they don't get paid a lot in emerging markets. So are you sure about that? I was like, um, you know, that's why I said I'm 50 or 60. I'll do this. And it's like, what do you mean? What do you actually want to do? That's why you want to be Minister of Science. And he said, I came from Silicon Valley, like all of us here, and I saw that ideas can turn to reality with both capital, mentorship, and also support. And he said, OK, if you come back to the Philippines, and that was an if, I will figure out how to fund that idea of yours. Right? So literally in a conversation, like in a kind of a boardroom, just me and, me and him. And I thought he was joking, right? Uh, but at the end of the day, I was literally the next day, I got like kind of a standing offer to head innovation with a telecom company and also with a promise to fund what is now called Idea Space with about $12 million, right? So I think that's another kind of lesson for at least the students, right? Which if an opportunity comes, you have to think what's really on your heart? What is that specific kind of turning point in your life? What is the pain point that you want to solve? Because the opportunity comes, you want to take advantage of that, right? So that was my moment. Um, and um, I just got married with my wife. She was pregnant with a second child. And I came back from vacation. And I said, I think we should come back to the Philippines. And she freaked out, right? But, um, but in the end, like obviously, she realizes why I'm doing it and what uh, was my heart. So, um, and what I did, actually, so I don't know. Uh, who hears from the GSB or at least knows about the GSB process or even just the Stanford general process, right? But at least in the GSB, we had one major essay and it's called uh, What Matters to Me Most and Why? What Matters to You Most and Why? Right? So I actually looked at my essay. It's kind of funny. And I thought, like, you know what? You just write it, try to get into Stanford, right? Uh, but I put a lot of thought of it. And then basically, I said the same thing, right? Like, um, it's kind of exaggerated a little bit where I said, Grew up in the Philippines, where most of the people, it's actually below the poverty line, if not just like in a hard place. I was exposed to the fact of this every day, right? But this is it, right? It's easy to shun away and ignore this, right? But then how do I have an obligation to go back, right? Again, this is a very kind of Silicon Valley mindset where how do you actually use your life to actually create impact, right? But then sometimes life happens and you forget, right? You forget like, oh, wow. You know what, like I actually wrote that down when I, you know, when I was like whatever, 24, 25 at that time. Right? And I said, this is maybe the true north. Right? So the big question that I was kind of grappling with, right, knowing the facts, right, like objectively, macro-wise, like there could be opportunity. Right? But then from a tactical perspective, can the country like the Philippines or broader like other countries like in emerging markets or even in Southeast Asia, like can you really breed the next billion dollar business of the world? And I said, maybe, maybe not. And let's see how it goes, right? So I ran, um, I co-ran this thing called the iPrize, which is Cisco's global innovation prize uh, during the time. So it was like 2010, 2011. And I said, wow, this is the type of billion dollar businesses that we were thinking about, right? In fact, you know, we got entries from 150 countries and we saw cloud computing was still in its infancy, it's kind of growing, enterprise SaaS, mobile apps, analytics, AI. We're thinking about holodex, video, holography, all these things, right? So this is what my notion of what is this answer to this question. Can the Philippines or an emerging market build the next billion dollar business? So I said, I have to promote people doing this, right? And I said, OK, what's the Philippines kind of famous for, right? Um, again, I think three out of the top 10 beaches in Condé Nast is based in the Philippines, right? Um, at the time, I think uh, we were famous for boxing, right? I think until now, Manny Pacquiao. And then I think now we're kind of famous for uh, political commentary. Um, um, so I said, okay, this is kind of what we're famous for. So are we famous for, are we famous for enterprise SaaS? None of this looks like enterprise SaaS. Are we famous for kind of all these other things? Like not necessarily, right? Or is this really kind of the needs, right? So I said, what, are the, what is the main points in society 
what can be the country be the best in the world in, and then who would want to help this, right? Who would want to help us, right? Because we're like an island nation in Southeast Asia, like who would really care, right? And then when I started to observe um, and ask that question, right? Like what is the main point of society? I saw real world issues. I saw real world problems. I saw that our pain points is not necessarily like how to check in code and create the next GitHub, right? This is a real issue, right? So for Haiyan, like, you know, more than 6,000 people died, 20, 28,000 people are injured, and a lot of people are still missing. We get on year per year, right, devastating cyclones landfall into the country, about 10 of them per year, right? And then an additional 10 that literally is a close call. Right? So we're just paranoid every day. But then that could be an opportunity. Right? Like, is disaster preparedness something that we should be very good at? I know Japan's very good at that. Right? But can the Philippines be good at that or response for that? I don't know. But those are the type of thoughts that I was thinking about. Another one is that I really saw the two worlds. Right? And I was mentioning, I think, to Edward a while ago, where you have literally you know, people in urban Manila who I think grew up the same, with the same GDP per capita, same lifestyle as someone maybe even San Francisco or Dallas or New York. Right? They get exposed to all these things. They travel all around the world, no limits. But this is literally a picture from Metro Manila where you have multi-million dollar condos and miles apart you have shanties on the river. So inequality is just kind of growing. In fact, I think the growth of the GDP, 50% of the growth of the GDP of the country went to the top 40 families of the Philippines, right? And um, I kind of over-exaggerated uh, a while ago, 90% is below the poverty line, but statistically it's about 25%. But our middle class, again, GDP per capita is about only $3,000, right? So their purchasing power in a global sense, imported goods, et cetera, is not the same. And then I also saw that there are industries that we're super reliant on, that I think we can be the best in the world in, but underinvested or underutilized. So for example, agriculture, it employs 30% of the country, it's 12% of our GDP, but I see that the farmers themselves and their families are not getting out of poverty. So how do we solve all these issues? But at the same time, I see this as an opportunity, like if we can just make a dent in some of these things, maybe we can actually uh, do something, right? And then I said, wow, what is the current state of the innovation ecosystem when I literally landed in the Philippines, right? So we have the Department of Science and Technology and then some foundations at the RD side. And then you have expansion capital, right? Um, you know, Series A, actually Series B already, Series B and above, right? So we, I saw there was a huge funding gap. Right? So from literally R&D or some people's idea all the way up to Series B, you have to figure out how to self-fund. Right? So this was the reality situation. I think it's probably no different than other emerging startup ecosystems that have grown over the past 10 years. Right? Only people already have connections, get to build businesses, tons of ideas get shelved. Right? And the frustration happens so much for the smartest people in the ecosystem that they just decide to leave and go to places like this, right? Uh, like in Silicon Valley. So how do we solve this, right? And that was like the big kind of conundrum in my mind, right? So during that time, and also realized that actually I have to engage with the government, right? So people say, oh, ignore the government, but in, in kind of these emerging markets, like you kind of have to use also the establishment and the government to help support industries because they control the laws, they control like kind of you know, enabling ecosystems, they can even release some funds, right? So we try to map out the ecosystem and figure out what do you wanna do in, in five years and look at like realistically what is our, what is our SWOT, right? What, what is that question? Like what can we be the best in the world in, right? So I said, oh, okay, and again, I, I was a co-author of this report, but I didn't, like, objectively, like, a um, uh, person, Beryl, who's in Cambridge now, kind of did the whole thing, right? 
So we looked at it as an industry and said, OK, what are things we can be good at, right? So again, young population, strong tourism, uh, BPO is about 10% of our economy. Remittances, actually, is also 10% of our economy. Um, and you know, maybe business climate. But then we have like kind of some issues, right? Unstable political environment, environmental change, heavy traffic, et cetera. And then also brain drain. So like everything else, how do you think of it objectively to build an ecosystem, right? So um, I, I, together with um, First Pacific, who's like a large business conglomerate, kind of started this thing called Idea Space, which is an incubator, accelerator, kind of for emerging market needs. So I'll play like a video, just a three minute of like what, what, were, what was our mission, and then I'll kind of go towards like what are the specific, um, let's see, view, I fit the screen, sorry, fit the screen. I think we're already set here. All of us have good ideas, but then few of us can execute them. And that is the biggest challenge. No matter who you are, no matter where you came from, if you are the best person to build your idea, then you can be the next Steve Jobs. It actually has a chance to change millions of people's lives. Greatness is all about doing something that matters to you and to other people. And doing it with the pureness of your heart. Not a lot of people, especially with very good ideas in science and technology, never get funded. Science and technology in the Philippines, and what really surprised me is it's real to people. People innovate, people invent because it is needed. So just imagine if you can pilot something in the Philippines and really have the guts to go beyond the country. Let me tell you, we can create products that can scale globally. The best entrepreneurs, honestly, the main trait is courage. Not a lot of us have the courage. But I think entrepreneurship is actually quite interesting because it blends your passion to what the world needs. I think Idea Space is all about creating change. You know, it's about building dreams, building ambition of people, and that then can hopefully translate to faster growth and economic development for us in the Philippines and for other emerging markets. The objective of Idea Space is to support science and technology ideas and to turn ideas into reality. We're basically helping technology startups bring their ideas off the ground. So we provide mentoring and funding to them, to any entrepreneurs who would like to pursue their ideas. If you do have the best ideas in the world, you should be heard. Our incubation program is to hopefully select the best ideas in the Philippines and other emerging countries. We go all around the country to find the next big idea and really find the next set of homegrown technopreneurs that can change the world. We really do it through a, you know, a, a call for applications like a national competition or international competition. Competitions bring the best in people, but then the best thing about competitions is it levels the playing field. We get around uh, 50 people and what we do is we really talk to each one. We really want to get a feel of how serious they are to solve the problem that they're talking about. I actually am an advocate of creating friction in the team because when they have friction, they learn how to resolve things. As a startup, you have to have the best team. You have to get the best people to be on board. You want to have a very strong anchor, and your anchor would be your teammates. Your goals are never defined by other people, but just by yourself. Anybody, regardless of who you are, what your last name is, has a chance to write their own destiny. A very wise person once told me that you have to follow your passion. I guess it's a combination, doing your passion and doing something that's really of value to people. What I really want is that people all around the world would think of the Filipino and the Philippines as a country where great innovators live. So uh, as you can see, it's, you know, idea space is, is part functional, but also part inspirational. And why is that, right? And I mentioned that before because until maybe about five years ago, our ecosystem was still immature that literally like if you had a good idea, but you didn't have the connections, the knowledge, et cetera, 
you would be stuck forever, right? So we wanted to show a different paradigm, like the paradigm that we share here in Stanford and Silicon Valley, that you actually have an idea, you can take it if, you are, if you're good, right? But that doesn't exist, I think, in even 90% of the world today, right? I think people feel that there's no hope, and they try to figure out how to, to buy a plane ticket to go to San Francisco, right? But we had to show a message that it is possible now, right? So in fact, what do we do is that we have kind of this annual kind of call for application and we give support, right? So I think our support, and now even now don't even take equity anymore, um, of about 30, dollars to $30,000 of support for a, literally an idea or a prototype to take them to first, um, first customer or at least first revenue, right? So again, think about that. Our GDP per capita is about $3,000, and we give 10x GDP per capita to literally take them to get a fighting chance, right? And then another thing that we do from a culture perspective, because people were a bit doubtful, like, is another one of this, you know, you're going to have connections. We take out names and affiliations on our first pass for every application, right? So people are like, yeah, whatever, what's in a name? But actually, names represent huge advantage, right? Last names in particular, huge advantage in emerging markets, right? So we had to do that. So what surprised me? And people are like, what makes your accelerator different? And again, sorry, it's not into scale. Like I was trying to hack like Excel yesterday. I was like, oh, I gave up, sorry. Um, what surprised me, and then I, got, I had some Stanford GSB interns. We have a program with a GSB. So I got an like a ex-McKinsey guy to help me build the slide like a year ago. And, and then in the end, wow, right? I was expecting, again, enterprise SaaS, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, all these things. But what I got, and we get about 700 to 1,000 teams applying every year now for about four years, is that you still have this. This portion, right? Mobile, telecom, digital media, et cetera. But then we got a huge amount of applications in what I call this emerging market issues. Transportation, water, energy. And I said, I asked some entrepreneurs, why? And they asked, just simply answered the question. That's what our community needs. And I was like, wow. So this was honestly like my like, messed up my mind moment, right? Like, it is different. It is different, right? Like, my notion even of what, like, my startups I'll fund four or five years ago and what I now focus on is very different because I had to react to what really the community, what really the entrepreneurs are saying. Like, I want to invest a portion of my life to solve these issues because I know it will help people, right? And actually even make money, help people and make money. Right? So I was like, oh, interesting. Right? So just some thoughts too. And I thought like, wow, you know, when I started this in 2011, like how will this grow? And in fact, like in our competition, like uh, I think last year in 2015, we get applicants from like other parts of the world, uh, I think in every continent at least, right? So we got someone, some from Africa and some from, uh, from Latin America, but mostly from, still from Southeast Asia. Um, to apply to us with the notion of like, we want to actually help solve an emerging market issue, right? So in fact, that's a challenge. I think it's kind of becoming a trend here, but still very few investors in Silicon Valley think, can we actually put in money into agriculture? Innovations agriculture. Can you put in money into like, you know, bottom of the pyramid innovation? Financial services like remittances. These are, I think, billion dollar opportunities that just a few people are actually chasing right now. So some people around the world th thought like, hey, yeah, makes sense. And then at least from a geographical perspective, one thing that I'm pretty proud of that we get an applicant from every part of the Philippines. Again, that's 7,107 islands. Like literally like my team every weekend goes to a different island and advocates for us, right? So I'll give you some examples of some startups. I know Professor Dasher wanted me to talk about like some examples of what, what actually I've either funded or supported, et cetera, right? So, You'd see this, again, portion of it is mobile, right? So we have like location-based promos, flash sales, uh, mob card, like I was in the board of mob card, right? So um, people like discounts, but their insight was 
it's mobs, right? So our culture, like we want to we go in large groups, right? So your school affiliation's big, your community affiliation's big, even your family name is, is big. So how can we create like discounts based on your group, not necessarily anything else, right? So we have a big like cultural affiliation with groups. So that's why it's called the mob, right? Mob card. Um, it's kind of spotty. So Leanne, who is here, is like I think now 22 or 23. Um, he was an intern in Idea Space, and then I think after his sophomore year, um, I think in junior year, like he didn't come back anymore to Yale, and he said, "I actually want to create a solar business." And again, I'm telling these stories because I want you to understand the psychology of the entrepreneurs, right? And I said, "Solar business? What do you mean?" And his his mom is a senator, right? And I was like, "I, I thought you're going to go to politics." But he said, I actually realized that if I actually go and become an entrepreneur solving a real world problem, I can make the same impact if I was in politics. Right? Um, so I think he's in indefinite leave in Yale or something like that. And he started uh, a solar business. He got $10 million investment uh, to build this. Is, is he doing arrays or what, what, kind of, what kind of business? So just think about it like as like a solar city of the Philippines, right? Okay. So he just installs, okay. but then he he literally builds like solar farms, okay. right? In kind of you know other parts of uh, kind of the Philippines, right? Sounds like a grid. Um, we also have obviously these types of things. So I think Philippines is the top five most expensive like, energy markets kind of in the Philipp in the world. So um, a bunch of entrepreneurs also thought, why can't we create like a device that monitors your energy real time. We put it to small, medium-sized businesses and kind of you know coffee shops, etc., so that they can save money. Um, so that's some uh, some guys too. And then this is kind of weird and unusual, right? So people are like, oh, I thought you're a technology incubator. Why did you fund a tri you know, default bicycle company, basically, right? Nifty. Um, and then now there's even a bamboo version of the Nifty, which is kind of funny. Um, but it's not funny actually. It's kind of cool. Um, and, and then I realized, because of also kind of this weird demographics that, you know, Metro Manila, I think, on average, about 15 to 20 million people, right? So now that everything is like in urban areas. So they said our problem is storing our bicycles. So we just created like a three-fold bicycle. I think it's one of the smallest kind of sizes. You can put it in your like kind of suitcase and put it everywhere, right? So who, um, who's buying this kind of bicycle? So this one is, again, some entrepreneurs that basically. Or that's who's making it. But um, is the market people who are commuting, who want to get yes, around so the traffic? Yes, exactly. So it's people who are now living kind of in um, very small urban apartments, right, that have this because they want to move around but not necessarily be constrained by space, right? I mean, if you have like a big bike, right, like sometimes it's even bigger than your apartment. <laughs> so you want to have this type of option. Um, and then this is like another thing. So queuing system, I talked about this like when I talked about Idea Space four years ago. Uh, so they were one of my first cohorts. And um, what it is, in essence, also is that so for people don't wait in line anymore. So it'll just message you or text you or like tell you like, oh, this is now your number. And I was like, of course, you know, people don't want to wait in line, but who has this problem? And in fact, their first client uh, was Western Union in Hong Kong and Malaysia and I think in other parts. Why? Because culturally, people still want to wait in line even for three, four hours to send money back home. Because it's their hard-earned money that has to go to their relatives, literally, in that week or else they won't eat. Right? So that was their kind of first client is for people to not wait in line. I mean, they can go around and go to McDonald's or whatever. And then now they found their product market fit actually in kind of travel sales. I don't know if it makes sense, like travel expo. So people like airlines, like Cathay Pacific or like United Airlines, like they do like one expo per year and sell like fire sale tickets. And people are willing to wait in line for like five to 10 hours to get like a cheap ticket to America or to Dubai or something. And so they're, that's their product market fit now Like they're going like uh, kind of crazy and banks as well. So, um, you know, and again, again, I mentioned kind of Chino and their team before. So they're actually from uh, a place in the south where it's quite troubled, like in Mindanao, where there's like Tawi Tawi and Zamboanga, where there's a lot of like kind of insurgency and stuff. But they said, how do we create this despite the fact so we can inspire our actually, their vision is to create a global company, even in a war-torn area. 
right? So the, you know, they get like, I'm giving you all this thing because the motivations are real, right? It's not because I just want to make and solve the problem. Some of the real motivations is some of this, right? And then uh, kind of my last example uh, is salt. Um, so it's basically like it's a, it's a catalyst here. Um, you put salt in water, and then it literally just has a circuit to amplify the, the energy of that, like kind of the ambient energy of salt water, right? So uh, and I think in some experiments in like you know grade school or high school, like you oh okay. we put like the two like kind of rods in your uh, electrodes. Like, oh, there's a small current in the soil, right? So they just kind of figure it out. And then now I think it goes up to 8 watts. So it's either 8 LEDs. So this is like their first prototype. Now they have a better prototype. 8 LEDs. Or you can even charge your cell phone. Um, so it's about 8 hours of light for a, a cup of water and 2 spoons of salt. Right? Um, so it's kind of cool. Like I think they're, uh, you know, they're, 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 they were invited in Singularity University a couple of, uh, couple of months ago. Um, they were in the stage with like, Barack Obama and uh, their mentor is Jack Ma, right? So it's kind of funny. So can you tell anything about the entrepreneurs themselves? How did they? Oh get yeah. Into this? So I, again, I had the kind of the most inspiring job in the world. So I was in a tier three city, Lipa, Batangas, which is like I mean, think about it, like a tier three city, and then um, Isa was a kind of a junior professor there. And um, I, I do like this kind of boot camps, like mini startup weekends, and people pitch to me, and I give them feedback and all these things. And then she said, like, oh, I can actually help amplify energy through salt water. And I was like, get out of here, right? Um, so in the end, um, you know, they didn't win actually the top one in, in even their whole like kind of school competition, but they were second place. And I said, you could either change the world with this idea or it's a bogus idea, right? But I'm willing to take a chance in you and feed you, you know, give you some seed money, right? And I asked them, what's the motivation, again, of Isa? So she used to work in Greenpeace, and she was based in the mountain provinces, right, of the Philippines. And literally, she said, I was in a town where literally there was no electricity, no light, no anything. And I was like, oh, it's probably like only a few people in the Philippines that have this problem. And we looked at the numbers, about 10% of 100 million, 10 million people live literally without light every night. And I said, OK, is this really like, you know, maybe a, our own issue? Apparently, according to, because ADB is one of my partners, 1 billion people in the world actually do not have light every night. So I was like, wow. Right? But her motivation was like, I want to help those folks when I was literally in outreach in, in Greenpeace to give them light at night because it's just so difficult, right? Because they had to do kerosene, right? So people walk 12 hours to like the next town to get kerosene for their entire like kind of village. And I was like, this is messed up, right? Like, so these are types of innovations and motivations that I think some of the entrepreneurs Actually, well, and, and that's a really important one for emerging markets because think about it. If people have light in the evening, they can read. They can start to study. You know, it'll yes. change the educational opportunities. In yes, the and then we said like light poverty, but also information poverty. So in the end, like sometimes you have signal, cell phone signal in remote areas, but then you just don't have charging stations because there's no electricity, right? In fact. Um, Chino, who again lived in an island in Mindanao in Tawi Tawi, he said. He had people from their town put cell phones in a boat, right? The boat goes for an hour in the next big town. They charge it, and then come back charged, right? Because they don't have electricity, right? So it's real, right? Again, it's kind of, kind of cool. But I liked it because they, during the pitch, they gave me a prototype in an ice cube tray and an LED. Right? And I'm in double E, so I was like, oh, okay, I kind of get that. I think my professor taught me like this kind of um, you know, ambient uh, thing. So all of this thing, um, I kind of packaged it uh, together in 2015, last year. Um, and I invited Professor Dasher to come to the Philippines when we hosted APEC Summit, which is the kind of coalition, trade coalition of the 21 nations in the Asia Pacific region, so US. The US, Canada, Latin America, Australia, China, Japan, Southeast Asia, right? 
And we hosted it in the Philippines, and we did the, the basically the innovation conference for the country, right? And then I realized that you know through Professor Dasher's kind of wisdom, and then I invited uh, my classmate who started Startup Chile, uh, Nico Shea, and then I think our our government realized that hey, this is actually an industry we want to help. We see the real stories of entrepreneurs. This is not a hoax. Let's support it. So now, in fact, which is kind of cool, we, again, we had the startup roadmap. We we're building a startup bill. Uh, and then uh, we also build a national innovation center. So my last question, and again, I'll probably wrap it up in like kind of five minutes or so. The last question that I mentioned a while ago was, who would help? Who would help? And I also got surprised by the answer to my question. Because when I looked at it, I said, you know, being in Silicon Valley, I said, oh, I just need like maybe business development companies, venture capitalists, entrepreneurs, right? Right? Companies to help, etc. Then I had to play many hats being like, you know, basically the head of the largest kind of startup accelerator in the Philippines, where I had to talk to development organizations. USAID, uh, you know, uh, Japan Aid, um, different organizations like EU, etc., and ask them, "Hey, can you help our entrepreneurs?" Right? Because they're addressing emerging market needs, right? Um, investors like v venture capitalists and stuff, because these guys, the development orgs, are willing to at least give grants or support for water, for energy, right? For efficiency. Uh, most investors, even all around the world, invest mostly in technology, right? So, so I had to have this to augment this, or else it'll be kind of more difficult, right? So accelerators, both um, locally in Southeast Asia, but also abroad. So, you know, 500 tech stars, uh, Y Combinator. We got to make sure that the pipeline is is there. Um, I also was part public policy government person, so I at least have a meeting with the government at least once a week to talk about, again, our law, our enabling environment, interacting other people, etc. cetera. Um, corporations, obviously students. I had to show students that this is another check that they can do, not just go to like corporate. Um, and then I had, I was lucky that I had like um, a, a, a partnership with uh, MIT, Stanford, and Harvard Business Schools to send free MBA interns to coach our startups. So that was kind of good. Uh, obviously, freelancers, uh, professional services. Uh, I think for, for National Innovation Center, JP Morgan um, was our kind of corporate sponsor. And also, obviously, there's, there's nothing without a startup. But you know, I went to Stanford Business School, but I didn't, you know, I was kind of prepared, but not really prepared to play government official one day, venture capitalist the next day, Business development pressure the next day, startup coach, board advisor the next day, et cetera. Right? So I just had to like hack it and wing it, right? But this is what we need. Building a fund in isolation does not work in emerging markets. You have to build the ecosystem as well, or else the whole equation will not work. Right? Um, so again, we just have to do it from literally from seed stage to IPO. And then um, we just launched like the National Innovation Center, which is a public-private partnership with the Department of Trade, Department of uh, Information Communication Technology, uh, Department of Science and Technology, and Idea Space to build like our national innovation program for the country. So that's kind of cool, right? So now, uh, I think this is like historical. There's probably even more now. Um, our you saw the picture a while ago, right? This was broken. And now, literally, like, I think we have a chain, which is what's happening, what, hap what is currently real in Silicon Valley, where at least there's now a chance for someone, a researcher, a scientist, a technologist, from R&D stage, and they know from a meritocracy point, from a financial point, from the goodness of their idea, they can potentially take it all the way up to expansion in the, I think the first time in history of the country, right? And again, the story of the Philippines is not unique. This is also happening in most parts now of Southeast Asia, um, at least Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, um, maybe now Myanmar is kind of going up, but at least those major uh, kind of markets, those markets in Southeast Asia, that's kind of what's happening. 
So this is our vision for our innovation center. Again, we, we have like a small space now, but we're building like a big kind of facility for this. And people are like, what is space? Space is just space, but it is also a symbol, right? That, you know, we have real world issues, we have real world problems, and perhaps innovation can help solve it, right? And I think that's our kind of mission. And these are the quickly questions that I think, right, I personally and my team and the startup ecosystem in the Philippines have answered, right? What is our pain points? There's real world issues, real world problems. We have to solve it. Can we best be best in it? I think we could be best in it if it's relevant to the entrepreneur, relevant to the country. Last one, who would want to help the growth of our ecosystem? Again, it's non-traditional people, non-traditional players, but they are a necessity in these types of markets. And um, thank you. So we've got some time for questions, and, and I want to ask the first one. Sure. So do you think that the system in the Philippines is going to become more and more like the system here in Silicon Valley, or do you think it will maintain a kind of different sort of structure, like that slide that you had, that involved government in different ways than we involve government here? Oh, <laughs> right. So I think from a, uh, from a structure perspective, um, we're probably kind of still a couple years away for us not to have the need to get government involved. And why is that? Because there's just some like, you know, laws we have to change, right? Yeah. Grants we have to do, et cetera. And then also right now from a cultural perspective, like, you know, people want to know like what does the government like endorse? So that will just give us like another healthy boost yeah. to grow the industry, mm -hmm. right? Because I think the best thing about Silicon Valley, what I learned about this is that, you know, government like get out of the way and we'll just push forward, right? So that's, I think, the current kind of mindset. At least that's, when I was in, you know, when I was in GSB, like that's the, the type of mindset that we, we had. But then I think in these types of markets, like the government has to realize that they actually should step out Right, rather than to step in, but then they have to at least accept that first. So just to give you a little bit of, of background, in April in our entrepreneurship series, we had Dr. Ed Rubesh from who lives in Thailand come and speak. Oh, okay, okay. And Ed pointed out that even though Silicon Valley is all about innovation, innovation in Silicon Valley has stopped being innovative, was the word that he used. Hmm. He said we've got such a well-established system, the system is running, but in a place like Southeast Asia, an entrepreneur really is still a pioneer. Correct. They don't have ready-made, oh yeah, I need an angel, or oh, I need a mentor, or oh, I need this. They don't even know what they need. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is a, a really interesting challenge to kind of help build this ecosystem. Uh, just to, to kind of take it back to sure. sort of the energy and environment theme, the main pain points, how much are those areas? I noticed that of the startups that you featured, several were about energy. Are you getting much on pollution? Are you getting people with ideas for solving those kinds of problems? Or Yeah, so I, I, I think the, the thing is, there's a couple of questions, right? Yeah. Like, first of all, like, you know, is there a need that I actually feel and even my immediate family feels? Again, that's a Philippine thing, maybe, or like a regional thing. Like, can I help the people that I care about? Yeah. Right. Right. So another one is, you know, is there really like a potential business opportunity that someone will kind of care about in the future? Right. So those are the two kind of main main things. And can I do something about it? Right. Mm -hmm. Like can I have technical yeah. knowledge to do it. Right. So in the end, like it is real. Right. So environment, pollution, energy, light. Again, but it's a bit different. Right. So even like assault is a good example where yeah. literally like. It is not building the next solar array, yeah. but then it's applying a certain technology, which is actually an open source technology, it's like in the science books, right? To then adjust. Well, you can find salt water just about everywhere. Yeah, yeah, so, but then you know, amplifying you know, a yeah. circuit to amplify that. Like right. I think you know, I, I've seen some science books. Like, I'll just make that as a hobby. But then, oh, but actually, I can apply that in a specific problem that I saw mm -hmm. personally, right? So. Yeah. I think that's a type of thing that I will see more. I mean, obviously, like Leanne also taking it, like how can I create like 
you know, an energy, like, uh, you know, solar kind of farm, etc. That's another thing that people will do. So I think people are just trying to tackle all these issues at the same time because it's happening, like, it's like organized chaos, right? So in the end, like, I just need to solve it. How do you pick a problem? Because there's so many problems to solve, yeah. right? So that's, like, I think the mentality now mm -hmm. of, like, emerging market entrepreneurs. Like, so many issues, so many problems. What do I want to do, and how do I dedicate my... Well, and I can imagine that on the business model side, even though, for instance, you said this solar company is sort of like Solar City, the business model can't work like Solar City. Yeah, it would right? be very different. Be yeah, very different. landowners or somebody else is paying for it, or, or somehow it's a, a B2B play instead correct. of a B2C play. Correct, that's correct. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is fascinating work. Um, how do, you've mentioned the system changes that you've seen over the last mm -hmm. five years. Um, what do you think it needs most now? So I think, um, I think now it's really, well, number one is to show more kind of success stories because I think even Silicon Valley is driven by it could be me, right? So it doesn't have to be even someone from the Philippines. It, could, it has to be someone that maybe is from at least the region, someone who people can identify with, someone who's a homegrown talent, right? Yeah. So those are the types of things that people are kind of grasping for, yeah. right? And the other one really is like, how do we actually unleash more capital for what I call is kind of emerging market issues, right? So I know in the World Economic Forum, UN, like we call it the you know, sustainable development goals. Yeah. So the world realizes that we need to invest in these issues. Mm -hmm. But where is the capital going to come from? Again, it's not just a Philippine or emerging market issue. Right. It's a global issue. Who will yeah. invest in water? Who will invest in education? Who will invest in aquaculture? Yeah. Agriculture? Yeah. Honestly, Alleviating like, if, you know, I, right. I, I'm in New York. Like, I don't know who's talking about that. Right? Yeah. So that is a, a fundamental shift, I think, that you know, maybe the innovation, financial innovation world should think about. Right. Again, I'm challenging it, you know, since it's going to be recorded stuff, like I hope people will listen. Yeah, and I think that you see opportunities here. Yesterday, I was at a really interesting pitch session organized by the U.S. Market Access Center oh, okay. where US they Mac brought yeah. in 10 uh, startup companies from Malaysia. Mm, okay. And one of the things that I'm seeing, especially since President Obama met with the ASEAN leaders in oh, February, yeah is the awareness of Southeast Asia as an area of opportunity has just suddenly become really noticeable. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you know Silicon Valley investors were sitting around in this pitch session listening to these companies. Yeah, I so, mean, it's a frontier market, right? 600 million people, the median age is like in their mid-20s, like, yeah. wow, right? If I was a, just a normal like macro investor, like, why not, right? Is idea space looking outside the Philippines or in other places in Southeast Asia or not? Yeah, so we have like a linkages. In fact, I okay. was in, in, in my last year, I was in Malaysia, I think four times. I was in Jakarta like in one year, like twice. So we all work together. In fact, mm -hmm. we call it, I think, the um, kind of the, the, you know, the bamboo or whatever. I don't know, like basically like we have a coalition of people who want to help bring change for the entire kind of region mm -hmm. through innovation. Right, so we are all kind of interconnected. In fact, even Idea Space, like, I wanted to expand. In fact, we have we have applicants from I think most, if not all, countries in Southeast Asia. Okay. Right, because I think people now are thinking, can I be a citizen of the region, not just my country? Right. So that's like that's the, actually the a big thinking change. Thinking process yeah. that's happening just literally recently. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, because I realized, like, wow, you know what? Like, can I actually have this mobility, right, and take advantage of this growth market? Right. So one more question for me, and we'll open it to the floor. Sure. What's it like to move back to New York City, or to move to New York City? I, I don't guess you lived there before. Yeah, so, um, well, I, I went to Cornell uh, oh, okay. of, uh, Engineering, so it's okay. a little bit north. Um, I think it's, it's both good and inspiring, but at the same time, like, there's a part of me where I, you know, I want to make sure that like, this work continues and Southeast Asian growth continues. So, that's why like, I'm actually like, heading like, the, the stack chapter in New York, mm -hmm. because we realize that we actually can make a good story unleashing again financial capital towards these emerging market issues. So that's like one part of it. But the other part, like, I'm not directly talking to entrepreneurs face-to-face -face 
in yeah. tier three and tier four cities and saying, mm -hmm. but you know, like every good entrepreneur, like after you know four years, you trust your team that you built, and that I think is the biggest thing, right? So you know, I left Geeks in the Beach is there, so you know, um, you know so I, I kind of yeah. helped do that. You know, Slingshot is alive, which is like this government program. Mm -hmm. We, the people that I created with the National Innovation Center, like it is still happening. And Idea Space is about to invest in 10 new companies again. So, you know, to pick it up to like 60 plus. So I think that is the mark of an entrepreneur. And then I just, I'm in the Philippines like at least twice or three times a year to make sure things are still moving. Yeah. But it's hard, right? Because in the end, like you're used to being literally on the ground. And now you have to take a step back and more of like, what is the policy? How yeah. can I enable? How can I get other people to be interested in the region? So those are the things that I'm like tackling right now. Okay. So open the floor. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the solar manufacturing. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, there must be a demand for it, which is why it's, it's going well. But I'm wondering in the past, you know, what the solar looked like in, in the Philippines? Has it been, you know, has there been no like, unified corporation to install those panels? Yeah, so, um, and mo so the question really is like about kind of solar panels and the opportunity for that and historically like what, what was a solar kind of environment, right? So like, I don't know, like, I don't want to say like, like most emerging market, but at least in the Philippines, like the electric utilities dictated a lot of the culture, like what is energy and how actually it's going to be consumed, right? But then with this type of um, kind of company kind of sprouting out, they realize like actually we can, you know, have alternative sources of energy, right? And then solar, I think for the past couple of years, like it's been like, much cheaper. I think the cost for solar has been going down like rapidly. So can this I ask was a, just a, like a real an affordability. basic question on this. Is this going to be on grid? Will it be connected into the main grid? Yes. Or is it? Okay. Yes, it is connected. So it's so not just completely local. No. Okay. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. So it's, I mean, obviously, like, there's some um, kind of solar companies that want to do that distributed grid where literally, like, mm -hmm. in kind of remote yeah. islands and stuff. But at least for this model, like, how can you put it? you know, as a complement kind of to the grid to sell it to... So this runs into one of those huge policy questions, right? Yes. To what extent will... I'm guessing that the main grid is... Is it a state-owned company, a, a monopoly? Uh, it's a monopoly. Okay. It's not state-owned, but it's a monopoly. So it's typically private, private monopolies don't company. really like to see other producers. <laughs> um, was there a lot of government kind of involvement to allow a company like this to happen? Yeah, and it, that's exactly what I'm saying. Like, where if you're a venture capitalist, if you're an investor, you're an advocate for entrepreneurs, all you want to do is to level the playing field. Yeah. Right? So that's why you have to talk to, like, kind of policy and all these things to make sure that if a company like Solar or a company similar to that, like, comes up with an idea, like, just don't stop them, right? Don't let, like, the big guys, like, crush them. Like, those are the types of things that you want to try to help. Right. Right? So, um, I think that's that's kind of it. But historically, like you know, maybe there's solar here and there, but it wasn't as organized, or there wasn't even a company to say I will focus solely on that. Maybe there's people importing solar. A lot of people just do like import export, but not to build a business model around it. Yeah, I so mean, this, this is, is like something a that new this is something that we've had issues with here. Actually, mm -hmm. my understanding is that the big car companies tried to shut down Tesla Motors like 15 or 20 times, and <laughs> yeah. a lot of it was done through <laughs> regulation. Exactly. You know, pressure that they could put on the government. Yeah, I, I think so, right? Yeah. That's why you, again, it's kind of, I think there's some analogies now, right, where, you know, I'm tackling it because I want to make sure that this industry will actually grow through yeah. public policy. So I, I don't know what just happened, but I did not ignore the fact that I needed the government. Right. And that actually, I think, helped spur the ecosystem. Well, and maybe that conference did do something. I mean, it, it was buried away, but in Slingshot Manila, the two sponsors were the Department of Trade and Industry and the Department of Science and Technology. And I think I was told that it's really remarkable that you get the ministries of both <laughs> government departments in the same place at the same time. They just don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's it. And then really, like, because it was like a big APEC thing, they realized, yeah. like, oh, like U.S. is talking about it, Canada's talking about it, Russia's talking about it, like Australia's talking about it, like, you know, why aren't we talking about it? And then there was a big wake-up call, like, it's yeah. real. It's real. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Earl, how are your VCs organized, and what kind of expectations of return do they have there? And then your entrepreneurs, um, do you have any entrepreneurs that like this enough they want to become serial entrepreneurs, or would they want to continue to own the company and maybe have the company inherited by their own children? And so, uh, so that's actually a very, very good question, right? So culturally, the answer to your second question was like, I'm going to build a business, and literally I'm going to make that the family business like sustainable, right? But I think the mindset has shifted. Again, we're a very young population, like, like 24, 25, right? So when you get these type of entrepreneurs, then they're actually more open. They see what's happening here. They see what's happening in other places. Like, you know, my goal is to not necessarily, um, you know, have like kind of, you know, uh, what I call a lifestyle business or something like that. But literally, like, how can I exit that? How can I sell it? Like, you know, again, Alibaba's, mm -hmm. you know, expanding to Southeast Asia. I think Amazon just announced they're going to have a Southeast Asian kind of kind of presence. Other companies from other places are all going to Southeast Asia. So they realize I could actually have an exit, right? The question, though, actually the bigger question is, if they get an exit and they get absorbed by a bigger company, will they quit in two years or three years like here, or will they stay? In the big company. In the big company. And I think that's where it's to be seen. Because my inclination is that I think a good number will probably stay, especially if they get good packages from multinational companies, right? So I'm hoping that we can get that kind of flywheel to entrepreneurs. But maybe that's enough. Maybe that inspiration is enough to just feel like a fuel of, of, of that, right? Um, from a multiples perspective, right? So this is like something that I've kind of seen where at each stage, you know, your initial VC just expects like the normal like times you know, times three to times four of the next round, right? So if you kind of come in extremely early, hopefully you get like, you know, 10x return. But the risk profile, though, in emerging market, just I have to admit, is actually very high, right? So you can fund something like in Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Thailand. But the macroeconomics, because again, you're dealing with first-time entrepreneurs a lot of times. Right? Again, I'm looking at from the risk as a VC, right? risk perspective, right? First time entrepreneurs, the macroeconomic market is still not set up to be easy to create some of these things. Most of the time, internet is not very, very, very fast, right? So you have a lot of constraints. So can you factor that into your model to actually justify your risk? So some people say that's fine. So in fact, a lot of these folks Right at this stage, which is like you know hundred thousand plus dollar stage, like a lot of them are like Japanese, ultimately Japanese funded um, venture capitals, right? So the LPs are from Japan, right? And I thought, why is that? Because they actually th those type of risk they can tolerate, right? But then very few people like direct from the U.S. and having like a Southeast Asia based kind of venture capital directly from the US because they said, oh, either there's more opportunities here or the risk tolerance that I have, I still cannot quantify the risk for me to do it. So a lot of times, in fact, when I was doing kind of fundraising here in the US, they said, get me to revenue and I will be interested, right? So this is like the Silicon Valley VCs. Get me to revenue and I'll be interested. But I'm like, but you fund people just based on growth. Oh, but it's too risky. This is reality, guys. This is reality, right? So how do I deal with that? How do I make sure my startups are set up to either get institutional funding here in the Valley or somewhere else, and then maybe get regional players who can absorb that risk a little bit more with potential multiples, right? So those are the types of things that reality kind of hits, right? So. OK, um, thanks. Bevan? I was impressed by your picture of the uh, Typhoon or the kind of a disasters which it, every year Philippines has. Oh yeah. So that means the government, if government is going to do anything, help those people, then every year it is a lot of the money spent on help those things. Yes. How come nobody has an idea? Says so, okay, I will subcontract to government, get the money and get the things ready and fix all this problem quickly. Nobody think about this kind of thing. So <laughs> subcontracting to the government is a bit difficult, right? Because you even don't know if like 100% of what you give will actually go to the end, right? Um, just tell you frankly, right? So I think the opportunity, though, is how if this thing happens all the time, what are the types of innovations that actually we can use so that the next time it happens, we know what to do? So in fact, that's why. Um, 
salt or like other kind of lighting situations were were very interesting during the time of Haiyan because you know we had like teams from our telecom company go there and they said for the first seven days literally the whole grid was gone like the whole town was gone right so everybody was living they're already in dire conditions and they're even living in pitch black at night it's unbelievable right so so those are the types of like real reality situations do so in fact like can we get like uh, or, or, or um, the worst part, obviously, is like cholera and like, you know, having kind of water and all these things, right? So, so in fact, like if I, if I was also an entrepreneur, I mean, obviously, I'm funding these things. Like water purification for disaster is, a, is like a good opportunity. Another opportunity is like shelter during these things should be an opportunity. Another one is like, can you have like kind of satellite internet so that you can have like, you know, figure out the logistics during a certain time? And obviously, like light mm -hmm. and sanitation and all, all these things, right? So specializing in this part, which is, again, not unique to the Philippines. Other parts of the world are prone to this. I think that's just a no-brainer, right? So uh, in fact, like IDS, um, First Pacific also funds um, Idea Space. Uh, they are also in a coalition of like kind of disaster foundation, um, readiness foundation of the Philippines. China addressed specifically this disaster as well. OK, right? good. Yeah. University of California, Stanford, they provide a lot of the foundation for Silicon Valley. Now, so when you look at the Philippines and you say what's the quality of the engineering education, and you've had your engineering education here in the United States, yes. how would you compare that? And do you think that it's at the level where it's, it can compete with world-class engineers that we have, let's say, in Silicon Valley? So I think... Um, so in fact, there's a new trend now in the past two years where literally like there's a lot of remote teams, like not just outsourced, right? Like literally remote teams of Silicon Valley funded startups that have Philippine offices. In fact, this, there is one company, I think it's in the Nero, where the CTO literally spent six months in the year to actually build out their, their Philippine team and then six months obviously here because he's the CTO of the startup, uh, Silicon Valley funded startup. Just so out of curiosity, is it software? It's software. Yep, it's because software. we should never underestimate how good the education is in the Philippines for software especially. Yeah, so the one thing that's missing though, um, and again, I've been kind of frank about this, right? So which is the technical management talent and the business like scale and growth talent. And why is that? It's just exposure, right? So in the end, like how many people, even professors, right? Even speakers in their schools, have said, like, I actually have managed someone that did a web scale technology, right? Grew it from one user to, like, you know, even from hardware, like, one product all the way up to, like, 10 million, 20 million products. Probably nobody, not even their yeah. professors have even a story to tell, yeah. right? So that's the unfortunate reality. I think from a raw talent perspective, it's there. From an exposure perspective, um, we need to do a little bit more so we can grow that next level, not just the engineering talent, but the technical management mm -hmm. talent and the business development and growth talent. That's, I think, very sparse, if not non-existent. Okay, right. next question. Errol, I thought um, what you said about um, the question, what can the Philippines be best in the world in is really important because you touched on the fact that there are fundamentally different real problems in the country. I was wondering, um, as you've met these entrepreneurs, as you've been on the ground, have you um, now had some answers to that question? Aside from disaster preparedness, I'm just curious, what are the other things that the Philippines specifically can be the best in the world? At? So, yeah, in fact, I was in, the, again, Geeks in the Beach talking exactly the same question. So, I think disaster preparedness and that's like the environmental related stuff. The other one was I, I was telling people is, um, again, 10% of our GDP is in um, you know, remittances. I mean, if we're, if we're not, and I hope that someone says, we're gonna, the Philippines will be like the number one remittance company in the world. Because we, you know, it's like, it's there, right? So it's pretty obvious. The other one is like, 
I hope someone actually creates like a BPO technology or a technology to actually address like outsourcing. Because again, another 10% of our GDP is outsourcing. We have the world's data there. Why can't we have like analytics to it or literally like how to enable the next BPO from a technology like in the Philippines to then get imported out, right? So if like China wants a BPO, can we have a technology that goes with that? Because Again, the BPO could leave, right? So how can we actually extract value even if it leaves at some point? Remittances also could go down. But then how, but flow of money won't. Earl, when you're right. talking about remittances, are you talking about remittances into the Philippines yeah. or Go, from the Philippines? Okay, going into. In, in, okay. Internal okay. remit, uh, yeah. yeah, from out in. Yeah. So about 10% also of our population lives outside the country. Right. So obviously correlated to that is 10% of our GDP from a you know, right. revenue perspective mm -hmm. also comes from the outside. So you know, in my opinion, like someone has to crack that code because the flow of money, I think, is not just, again, a Philippine thing, but like there's always a flow between a developed country to emerging yeah. markets. Like that corridor is worth billions, if not trillions of dollars. And how do people do that better? better right. right. Again, it's not very good, so we'll have to do it better. OK. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? We've got some uh, refreshments outside. We've got some refreshments outside, and we can stand around and get to meet each other and talk a little bit more with Earl. If you would, please join me in thanking Earl for a great talk. Thank you. He asked me kind of one question while I was there on vacation. He said, what's your goal in life, Earl? And I said, you know, maybe when I'm 50 or 60, I want to become the minister of science of the country. And he said, like, you know, people in government, they don't get paid a lot in emerging markets. So are you sure about that? I was like, um, you know, that's why I said I'm 50 or 60. And I'll do this. And it's like, what do you mean? What do you actually want to do? That's why you want to be minister of science. And he said, I came from Silicon Valley, like all of us here. And I saw that ideas can turn to reality with both capital, mentorship, and also support. And he said, OK, if you come back to the Philippines, and that was an if, I will figure out how to fund that idea of yours. Right? So literally in a conversation, like in a kind of a boardroom, just me and, me and him. And I thought he was joking. Right? Uh, but at the end of the day, I was literally the next day, I got like kind of a standing offer to head innovation with a telecom company and also with the promise to fund what is now called Idea Space with about $12 million, right? So I think that's another kind of lesson for at least the students, right? Which if an opportunity comes, you have to think what's really on your heart? What is that specific kind of turning point in your life? What is the pain point that you want to solve? Because if an opportunity comes, you want to take advantage of that, right? So that was my moment. Um, and um, I just got married with my wife. She was pregnant with a second child. And I came back from vacation. And I said, I think we should come back to the Philippines. And she freaked out, right? But, um, but in the end, like, obviously, she realizes why I'm doing it and what uh, was my heart. So, um, and what I did, actually, so I don't know uh, who hears from the GSB or at least knows about the GSB process or even just the Stanford general process, right? But at least in the GSB, we had one major essay. And it's called uh, What Matters to Me Most and Why. What Matters to You Most and Why. Right? So I actually looked at my essay. It's kind of funny. And I thought, like, you know what? You just write it to try to get into Stanford, right? Uh, but I put a lot of thought of it. And then basically, I said the same thing, right? Like, um, it's kind of exaggerated a little bit, where I said, grew up in the Philippines, where most of the people, it's actually below the poverty line, if not just like in a hard place. I was exposed to the fact of this every day, right? But this is it, right? It's easy to shun away and ignore this, right? But then how do I have an obligation to go back, right? Again, this is a very kind of Silicon Valley mindset where how do you actually Now it's uh, kind of funny, um, a couple of years ago, um, I, I actually uh, invited Professor Dasher to give a talk for the APEC summit that we hosted in the Philippines. And he was um, extremely generous to actually spend uh, 12 hours on the plane and give the keynote for the APEC Innovation uh, Summit that we hosted in Manila. 
Uh, and actually, because of that, Professor Dasher, uh, we then created a national innovation center because we proved to actually wow. to the government that the industry was real. It wasn't a kind of a cottage industry, but actually an industry that the government should support. So, well, I remember that uh, Slingshot MNL was yes, the name of this conference. Yeah, so, and I remember 115 or 120 startups that had demonstrations there, so including we, some really interesting little companies. We were pretty lucky um, uh, at that point in time. So I think my talk will, 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 will discuss really the evolution of our ecosystem, what types of startups actually have come out of our ecosystem, and maybe how different it is compared to even my time here in Silicon Valley of what type of startups have emerged in this type of emerging market, right? Um, so um, that's kind of what it is. So what is the story of the Philippine startup <coughs> ecosystem, which I think the angle that I want to tell you today is how do we focus it on emerging market needs because that is the context and that it also is the, um, the driver or the pain points that people have. So uh, Professor Dash already kind of gave some color on, on my own experience, but just to add a little bit more. So I actually uh, was born in LA, but I grew up in Manila um, my entire childhood. And then I went to the US for college, uh, grad school, um, business school here. I uh, was an aerospace engineer, uh, kind of funny. I was in Raytheon uh, for that. a bit, and then I went to Cisco. And after a, a couple of years, actually I was here for about 12 years, and I was really thinking of, you know, what's happening back in, in the Philippines. Um, you know, I've been here for a while and I said, you know, how can I actually think about it and, and give back what a knowledge I've had and literally spur up the startup ecosystem, right? And at the time, actually this is like the current, I think this type of statistics is something to appreciate the entire Southeast Asia where in fact investments has been going from all over the world, from Europe, from Japan, uh, from China, and from the US to actually help the entire block of Southeast Asia. It was about 600 million people with also kind of a median age of about the mid 20s to make it like economic kind of powerhouse over the next couple of years. So, um, so that's another thing to kind of think about is when we, I talk about the Philippines and the opportunity in the country, also think about what is the opportunity in the broader region of ASEAN. Right. So, um, and I've been a kind of a witness of both the Philippines and the ASEAN perspective over the past five years. Um, so, um, 500 startups has like a kind of a semi-annual kind of investor geek kind of um, kind of gathering where they bring in like 40 to 50 investors to certain regions and different parts of the world. So I was like the Manila host, and I was also part of Geeks in a Plane Southeast Asia for with 500 and Dave, kind of McClure and Kylie. Um, I also started this kind of conference called Geeks in a Beach, kind of a fun conference. Uh, and most of it are probably international investors, and we just said like, why would someone come to the Philippines and learn more about our culture and our startup ecosystem? And uh, by the time we had the number one beach in the world called Baraka, until now it's actually number one from Condé Nast, and uh, I said. Wanted to create like a cool um, kind of conference called Geeks in the Beach. Um, I'm also an advisor uh, to uh, the Philippines through Stack Science and Technology Advisory Council. Um, I started Idea Space, which is still the largest uh, startup incubator and accelerator in the country. Now we have about 50 plus startups. I think we're going to invest or support again another 10 over the next couple of months. And then I'm also part of the WEF uh, YGL, which literally thinks about how do we use innovation to impact billions of people, right? So improve the state of the world. Right, so some personal story too. So I'll, I'll talk about many different stories, both from my story and also an entrepreneur story of, of why we created something like Idea Space, right? So when I was about 17 or 18, I went for my, my first two years of college in the largest state college in the Philippines called the University of the Philippines. Um, so in order to get to the engineering program, so 70,000 take the test and you have to be in the top 2% of the entire test in order to qualify for the engineering program, right? Uh, so that's kind of what it is. So I grew up in relatively kind of, you know, elite bubble in the country. Um, so where I grew up, like that's where like kind of presidents lived and, you know, people like in our version of Hollywood lived and all these things, right? 
But then when I went to the state college, I then realized like, wow, you know what, like how, how different it is, the reality of the situation in an emerging market versus a place like Silicon Valley or New York, right? Where there is in a sense a lot of aspiration, but in a sense very limited opportunity, right? So my, literally, you know, my classmates, who again were the top 2% of 70,000, uh, were sons of farmers, taxi drivers. They were smart. I, you know, they got 90 in the test. I got 65, right? Um, and literally, they said that we're betting our family, literally generations of their family are betting their life on me, right? That I actually graduate from engineering, get a job, maybe go abroad, and then feed literally like tens, if not 15 people. Right? So that's the type of thing at age 18 or even 16, that's the pressure that they have. Right? So um, when I decided to leave, uh, the dean uh, of the college, which ironically now is the undersecretary of the Department of Science, um, basically scolded me for an for, for entire hour, if not hour, of two hours, and said, I took someone's spot because I should have, you know, I could have gone to a different school where literally in this, but I vowed to return, basically, right? Like uh, what uh, I think Douglas MacArthur said about the Philippines, right? So I said, I'm going to come back someday. And they're like, to see is to believe, right? Um, so I always had that in my mind. So that's basically the context, right? I said, at some point, how do we actually give more opportunities to, to people like my classmates, right? Who were way smarter than me but then not necessarily had the same opportunities that I had growing up, and even financial opportunities to just say, like, you know what, I'm gonna, I got a scholarship to go abroad, and I'm gonna go and literally like, uh, go undergrad somewhere else. So when I was about 27, 28, um, I got to meet, so actually, uh, Manny Panglin, MVP, g gave also a speech here in Stanford that Professor Dasher kind of hosted. And he stats, but at the time, it was kind of have some similar statistic where, I reflected as like an investor, why would I bet some portion of my life in maybe coming back to a place like the Philippines? So first of all, I thought like culturally, it's kind of cool. So we're the only uh, kind of Spanish colony in the entire Asian kind of continent. So I said like we party like the Latins. So if you guys have been to Latin America, it's kind of a cool culture. Um, but then we were also like a, an American colony for a while. So we actually do business like other Americans. Um, some, some random fast fa facts is that actually our national pastime is basketball because of the huge American influence uh, in the country, right? But uh, some other th things that I think objectively why a place like the Philippines would be somewhat uh, of a good investment for your career or in a sense kind of my career at the time and broader Southeast Asia is because of some of these facts, right? So number one, at least just from the Philippine context, it's already 102 million people. And just to give perspective, America is about 300 million people. So you have like one third population of like an America in one country, right? So like the Philippines. Most of them speak English, if not all. Um, and then for the past five years, actually, we've been at least 6% growth GDP year on year. So that's kind of in the hyper growth. In fact, the last time I spoke here um, in Stanford, in, in Professor Dasher's class, we were, I think, the second fastest growing economy in the world, about seven plus percent after China. But what actually catches a lot of attention of the investors from a, from a macro perspective, actually, is this, the median age of the country, which is about 24 years old. So what does that mean? There is just a huge amount of runway, both perhaps at the positive side, right? Growing middle class, consuming of the internet, et cetera. But then it could also go the other way, which is can we actually provide jobs and opportunities for this, I think, millennial first country, right? Um, our GDP per capita, the most recent one, is still kind of still relatively low. It's about $3,000 kind of per capita. And just, I just like to put there how many islands there is because you know, I think that that puts out uh, kind of a perspective of how also difficult it is to actually create a unified startup ecosystem for the entire country because they're not just one big landmass, right? Um, but I think